So here we are kind of in the middle of nowhere and we are driving the most awesome LT1 with an 8-speed, um, fine-tuning the transmission. As you can see, this Jeep is not only heavy, but it's got a lot of aerodynamic drag. Roof rack on top of a camper and lights and all this other stuff. This Jeep does have uh, some grill inserts, which you guys know I don't recommend. I don't recommend putting lights up front here, but this Jeep is running cool, so we're going to leave it alone. Maybe in the summertime they can make some changes. But it's pretty much got as much drag as you can get. And I've tuned this 8L90 according to the video that you're watching right now. And it's really shifting great. By the way, we're stopped here to change the batteries in the drone. And you can probably hear this LT1 ticking over at about 400 RPM. Let's listen for that. It's really a mild engine. You can hear the compression, but when you get on it, it's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Here we are in the Osimoso LT1 8-speed. We're basically driving a tank. This Jeep is really heavy. I think the Quadratec catalog could learn a lesson from this Jeep. But the reality is you don't really feel this weight with the LT1 and the 8-speed. Now that we have a lot of these LT1s out there, we're getting feedback. And the feedback is really a lot more positive than I ever imagined. We've got customers with these LT1s running them against cammed Hemis and walking away from them. And what's really amazing about that is these LT1s can crawl all day at 450 RPM. So they're very unobtrusive. The drivability is excellent. Your wife would drive it to the store. As far as the economy goes, guys are reporting anywhere from one to three miles per gallon better than their V6 got which is a significant improvement on a heavy Jeep. I will say that the heavier the Jeep, the more improvement you're going to see. If you have a lightweight Jeep on 32s, you're probably not going to notice those gains versus a Hemi or an LS. But if you have a lightweight Jeep on 32s, you probably don't need an LT1. So this Jeep was built a little while back, you guys probably remember, and the customer just decided to re-gear it. He had 538s in it with, I think, 38-inch tires, so that's a lot of gear. Y'all know the 488s, in a heavy Jeep like this, with 38 inch tires, wouldn't go very well. But this LT pulls it with no issue. Now you're gonna drop a gear or two on the highway because you got such tall gearing, but that's okay, you got eight gears. So the spread between the gears is really small. And that's where the manufacturers are going today. I look at the nine speed in my wife's Pacifica and we're not in ninth gear very often. We're hunting all over the place because we're trying to get the best gear to get the best efficiency and economy out of that engine. So that's what we're doing. We're gearing for all around use. Now because this 8L90 has a 4.6 low, that means we still have great launch performance. But then when we get on the highway, we got a lot of gears to choose from based on the environment, whether we're going up a hill, flat ground. At over 70 miles an hour, we're under 2000 RPM in this heavy Jeep, yet we're still accelerating hard off the line. So let's talk a little bit about tuning this 8L90. We went from 538s to 488s. That's a pretty big difference. And you're all tired of hearing me say that the 8090 is a torque management based transmission and you need to match it to the vehicle, the weight, the size of the tires, the aerodynamic drag, etc. So after a few years of dealing with this transmission, I've pretty much distilled tuning it down to just a couple of parameter changes. Now you can get into the torque management, which is really a massively complicated thing. So we're going to stay away from that because what I find is most guys end up doing more harm than good when they don't know what they're doing in tuning. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna tune this vehicle basically using gear ratios. By telling both the ECM and the TCM, that is the transmission module and the engine module, what the gear ratio is, we can change its torque output and how it shifts just by changing those two parameters. Now let me back up a little. This vehicle has a very late model 8L90. I do believe it's a 2019 transmission. This transmission requires the T87A. The T87s came out in the 8-speeds around 2014. The T87 can be easily tuned. It's not locked, and we use them in most of our bills 2014 to 2018. We can still get them to work in some of the 2018 transmissions. But now that we're moving into the later model 8L90s and now the 10L80s, we have to go with the T87A. Now, I had the pleasure of meeting one of the GM employees that actually worked on locking the bootloaders down on these modules 
And I remember him bragging about how difficult it's going to be to crack some of these new bootloaders. And he was right. If you look at like the LT5 controllers, I don't think anybody has cracked those. But the T87A has been cracked. It's somewhat of a lengthy process, but it's worth it. You have to send your T87A to HP tuners with the operating system that you want in it. Now, of course, they'll sell that to you if you want to buy it extra. They unlock it and send it back to you. And then the tuning procedure is a little bit different because they have to use basically a base tune. It can't read the T87A, so they supply you with this base tune. You mod it, then you load it into the vehicle, and it works just fine. You do have to license the T87A independent of the E92, and you have to pay to have it unlocked. So it's not cheap, but again, it's the future and it's what we gotta do. So when you get your 8L90 on the road, it's not as easy as the 6L80. The 6L80 was pretty much plug and play and go. Because this is torque management based, GM has a process of characterizing the solenoids. It's called a solenoid characterization. And basically what that is, is the flow rates, the adaptives, are programmed per transmission. So there's a identifier number on the side of the transmission. So when you program the transmission, you program in that solenoid characterization. Now if you lose that solenoid characterization, you're going to get a bunch of codes, P2 codes, powertrain codes. I don't remember the exact numbers, but they're like P28DA. And what it's saying is that that solenoid characterization has been lost. By far the easiest way to reset your characterization is to use GM software. You go in there with TDS, that's Technical Delivery System, and you perform a solenoid characterization. It just takes a couple of minutes. It's really easy to do. Some of you guys don't have a J2534 interface or GM software. So I have noticed doing a flash on the TCM with, say, HP tuners, and then clearing all the codes can clear up those solenoid characterization codes. Now once you get beyond that and you get all the codes out of it, you're going to hit the road. These things learn, they have adaptives. So when you first get it on the road, it's probably gonna be a little bit herky-jerky, but really not bad. These newer ones, especially the 18 and 19s, are pretty smooth right out of the box. The 14 and 15s were pretty bad. You had to drive them for a while to get those adaptives to learn. So just drive it as you normally would, and what you wanna notice is the shift quality. When does it shift? How hard does it shift? Is it shifting at the right time, and is it shifting at the right speed? If it's not, what we can do is play with those gear ratios. If you want it to shift firmer, you want to move those gear ratio numbers up. So let's say you're at 355 and you want it to shift firmer. You're going to go to, let's say, a 373 and give it a shot. Go out and drive it. Now remember, you have to flash both the ECM and the TCM. Then you're going to go out and drive it and see the results. If you think it's shifting too firm, bring those numbers down. Go down to 321, 323. I've actually gone down to 273 on some vehicles to get them to shift the way I like. And the results are excellent. It's like a one speed. It shifts so smooth. Some of you are saying, what about the vehicle speed? Well, the GM has multiple speed sensors built inside of the 8090 transmission. It has a transmission output shaft sensor, or a TOS. That sensor tells the computer what the speed is, so it can base torque management and shifting strategy off of that number. The Jeep receives its vehicle speed from the ABS module. The Jeep JK and the JL has wheel speed sensors, one in each corner. Those signals are sent to the ABS module, averaged, and then sent out over the CAN network. So it's not going to affect your speedometer, ESP, or any of the other vehicle speed functions in the JK. So it's an easy way to tune the 8L90 without having to learn a lot. A couple of years ago, my guy Mitch took the HP Tuner University classes on the 8L90. And the reality was, they didn't know a whole lot about it. Because once you start getting into these torque management tables, you can change things. And it's like a piece of fabric where you change something here and then it changes something over there and there were sometimes unexpected consequences. You can change torque management and actually change your idle speed. So it's interwound with the whole operating system. And what I find is by changing just the vehicle speed parameter, it takes care of everything else and makes everything work smooth. Now that's not to say if you have a good tuner or you are a good tuner, you can't go in and start messing with torque management. We messed with torque management in the early days of these LT swaps and we were able to get massive gains in torque, especially off idle. We were able to get enough torque off idle to break parts like axles with LT 5.3s. These engines are really capable of more power than they're putting out. You'll notice that I'm monitoring knock retard here. You can kick that spark up a little bit on the low and the high octane tables to get a little bit better performance and throttle response. However, if you're starting to notice a lot of spark knock, back it off because you don't want to have 11 and a half to one in direct injected motor knocking. 
And that's pretty much as far as I would go with the basic tuning of your LT. Pretty much run at stock. These things have massive torque. They have a lot of power right out of the gate. So unless you really know what you're doing or know somebody that knows what he's doing, I wouldn't mess with it. And I've had some customers have their LTs tuned and they're getting massive horsepower numbers, more than the Hemis and the LSs of the past, just because these engines are more capable. I've got guys camming them. You put a stage one cam in these, they run pretty awesome. We've done a few, but then you gotta start messing with the, the cam tables and codes related to the phasing. And you just gotta know what you're doing. So if you know what you're doing, these engines have a lot of potential. If you don't know what you're doing, don't do it. You can fine tune your transmission the way you like by using this quick tip I just told you about vehicle speed. Today when we sell an LT kit, we highly recommend the customer purchase HP tuners because these Gen 5s out of the gate, while they run excellent, do need to be tuned into your vehicle. So buy the HP tuners if you get a kit. Watch my video series on HP tuners. A lot of customers think that tuning is voodoo. They don't want to touch it. They don't want to get into it. So they would rather just take it to somebody else and pay hundreds of dollars to have it tuned. And if you're one of those guys, that's fine. But with the tuners available today, it is getting more simplistic. And as long as you follow the directions, you should be okay if you have any computer experience at all. So going from the 538s to the 488s made a pretty big difference in this Jeep. Before it was kind of like a go-kart. And yes, like I said, this thing is a tank. My guess is it weighs well over 7,000 pounds. You can feel it in the steering, but the LT hauls it with ease. So on the highway before, when you hit eighth gear, it just felt like you needed another gear because we were winding up in the low 2000s, maybe 2300 at 70. And you could just feel the horsepower of that engine and the torque, and it needed another gear. So now with the 48s, it feels pretty right. You get in the highway and you're at 70 miles an hour and the transmission kicks into the last overdrive and you're cruising along under 2000 RPM at 70, 75 miles an hour, completely a different experience than a 3.6 pen start screaming at four or five thousand rpm to go up some of these hills and again with the 48s they're going to drop a gear or two going up some of these grades i have a customer in arizona with 373s and 38s and at first he was a little hesitant because he said it was dropping into seventh gear in the highway after a while he drove it and it felt perfectly normal to him it's just like my wife's minivan running in seventh and eighth gear quite often on the highway even though it's a nine speed but then when he gets on flat ground or he's going down a hill it kicks into eighth gear and you get that economy and lower engine noise and lower vibration and it's just a better experience so i'm a big fan of gearing these things tall if you have a special need you're only going to crawl your jeep you're going to trailer it to the trail sure go ahead and gear it up but things are just different today these high gear transmissions are changing the game we don't need to have 538 gears with 37 inch tires to launch these things anymore because we've gone from say a 2.8 first gear in the old four-speed Chrysler transmission to a 4.6 low first gear. We're more than doubling the torque of the 3.8. The 3.8 just had over 200 foot-pounds of torque. This engine here has more than 200 foot-pounds of torque just off idle. So the game has changed and you got to gear appropriately and that's what these people did. And because they drive this Jeep a lot in the highway, I think they're going to see a good return in the long run because they're going to get better economy and better highway drivability. And there really is not a whole lot of downside off-road because again, the diverse gearing of the 8L90 and this particular Jeep does have an Atlas means that you're gonna have plenty of low range to do whatever you want off-road, even in this heavy Jeep. So I have this Jeep set to about 355. I had it at 323, but I thought it was shifting a little bit too lazy, which actually I prefer because I drive like an old man, but the customers stated that they want something between old man and performance so that's that's about where it is right now when you get on it it shifts somewhat aggressive but when you're just cruising around it's very mild and for you v6 guys driving a v8 especially one like this as you can see cruising at close to 60 miles an hour at 1600 rpm is really a cool thing i really think that it adds to the fun of driving your jk because instead of having a v6 downshifting and revving up screaming it just feels right. You got the sound of the V8, you got the torque of the V8, you get on the highway, the thing kicks into overdrive and you just sail along at a low RPM. Got a lot of videos coming up, so stay tuned.